Today is Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023, and we are back to the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us tonight. I want to invite you to be finding a Bible of your own and turning with me to Genesis chapter 47. We'll be there in just a few moments. And I also want to invite you to be with us in person this coming Lord's Day morning at 930 for our study of the book of Isaiah. I have enjoyed being in that class. Caleb is doing a wonderful job with it. And I think it is very important for me to be in a class to get my cup filled on a weekly basis. So I really appreciate the effort and the preparation is obvious uh, that has gone into that class over the past several months here. So we appreciate Caleb for doing that. And then make sure to stick around for worship at nine at uh, ten thirty rather for the worship assembly. And I'm hoping we can get back to our study of the book of Hebrews this uh, coming Sunday or Lord's Day morning. If you have any questions or concerns tonight, anything we can help you with, anything that we need to be praying about, give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. Uh, we would love to hear from you in that way. And if you've not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, we would invite you to do that as well. Um, I'm actually recording this class about a week ahead of time anticipating a trip to my in-laws just south of Dayton, Ohio. So I don't know what the future holds, uh, but my plan at this point a week out is to head to Ohio after worship on Sunday, April 30th, and to head back toward Madison at some point around uh, Wednesday, May 3rd. So again, I don't know whether that's what will actually happen. I'm saying that's what I would like to happen. And so I've kind of prepared ahead of time a little bit to try to get this done in case the travel is delayed for some reason. Who knows what may happen on a trip like that. So if you are hearing my voice, if you are seeing me on YouTube right at this moment, I just want to let you know this is Baxter of the Distant Past. Okay, so this is about a week ahead of time here. But anyway, we are back to the book of Genesis tonight. So this is the book of beginnings. It is written by the prophet Moses. And we're now looking at the life of Joseph. Uh, despite having been sold into slavery, he is now ruling in Egypt. He has saved the nation from this terrible famine. He has now saved his family by bringing them down to settle in the land of Egypt. So this brings us to Genesis chapter 47 tonight. Genesis 47, the first paragraph is Genesis 47 verses 1 through 6. Genesis chapter 47 verses 1 through 6. Then Joseph went in and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers and their flocks and their herds and all that they have have come out of the land of Canaan, and behold, they are in the land of Goshen. He took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? So they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. They said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now therefore, please let your servants live in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen, and if you know any capable men among them, then put them in charge of my livestock. Well, once everybody gets down to Egypt, Joseph introduces Pharaoh to his family. He makes the connection. Not everybody is in on this, but he takes five of his brothers. That'd be an interesting process. I kind of wish I could have seen how that went down, kind of like picking teams. Who gets to go meet the king with me? Uh, but Pharaoh, once he meets them, he wants to know what they do for a living. And just as Joseph had prepped them in our discussion of this last week, they explained that they are shepherds. And it's interesting to me that Joseph could anticipate that Pharaoh would ask this particular question. It's almost as if he knew exactly what was coming. You know, first of all, I think it's pretty normal to ask about someone's occupation. Our occupation is often tied very closely to who we are. What do you do for a living? Oh, and that tells me something about the other person. This is what makes a time of unemployment so difficult, in my opinion. It would be because we are tied to what we do, and if we're not doing anything, that's a hard time for some people. And so it's just interesting that uh, Joseph could anticipate this. So it's normal to ask about somebody's occupation. Our occupation is tied to who we are. Um, years ago, I took a graduate level uh, course in cross-cultural communication, and I just remember learning in that class that when two strangers get together for the very first time, they almost always start looking for what they have in common. Have you ever noticed this? 
you know, I, I've met hundreds, if not thousands upon thousands of people in my life. And, you know, you think back and that's the way it happens. If we meet a, a person we've never met before, you know, a lot of times it's, well, where do you live? Oh, you live in Ohio. Well, I have family living in Ohio. What part of Ohio? Do you see how that goes? We meet this total stranger. And a lot of times within 30 seconds or so, we start to find something that we have in common with this other person. Or maybe that question, what do you do for a living? Oh, you're an English professor at the university. Well, you know what? My dad taught high school speech in English for 10 years. And then we have something in common and we build on that and, and we get to know a person by finding out what we have in common. So, you know, it's natural, I'm just saying, to try to find something that we may have in common with the other person. So the occupation question may simply be a part of that. But we also need to remember that Joseph and Pharaoh had been working together pretty closely for a good number of years now. And, you know, I'm kind of thinking and imagining that uh, Joseph and Pharaoh had been together for many of these introductory type meetings, as Pharaoh and Joseph would meet with visitors and dignitaries from other nations who had come to Egypt to buy food. And in my opinion, Joseph knows Pharaoh is going to ask, what is your occupation? Okay, you see how that goes as well. I'm thinking about some of the meetings that we have as elders. <clears throat> Once you get to know your fellow elders and you go into a meeting, you, you start maybe anticipating what they're thinking or what's going to come next. And uh, that's just uh, part of getting to know another person. And then I would also point out, Joseph also knew that shepherd would be a very good answer to that question. I think he anticipates what Pharaoh's answer will be, which is, Excellent. We have a job just for you. So I think he kind of knows maybe there was a shortage in that area or he knows something else. We're going to get to that in just a little bit. Uh, but it's very important that they give this answer to this particular question. Not that he's asking them to lie or make something up. They had done a number of things in their lifetime. Uh, but basically focus in on the shepherd thing. Give that as the answer. So they talk about where they hope to land up in Goshen. Uh, this sounds good to Pharaoh. And so they agree to this. Not only that, but Pharaoh also arranges for somebody in this family to take care of his own personal livestock. He makes a job offer there. Uh, this is a huge responsibility. It would have been a huge honor as well uh, to be in charge of all of Pharaoh's personal flocks and herds. So we don't really know how that ends. We don't know if somebody steps up to that responsibility. Uh, we just know here that the offer is made and it would have been a tremendous honor showing a great deal of trust. If you guys are anything like your brother, I want in on that. I want you guys taking care of my stuff. So this brings us then to Genesis 47, verses 7 through 12. Genesis 47, verses 7 through 12. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many years have you lived? So Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my sojourning are 130. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my fathers lived during the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had ordered. Joseph provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food, according to their little ones. Well, the first thing I notice here is that when Joseph brings his dad in to meet Pharaoh, his dad, Jacob, is the one who blesses Pharaoh, not the other way around, as we might expect. You know, it may not always be the case, but in my mind, the one who is greater will often bless the one who is lower. Or lesser, kind of like a father blessing a son, or like a priest blessing the congregation, or like a king blessing his people. It doesn't go the other way around. Uh, but here, Jacob is the one who blesses Pharaoh, not the other way around as we might expect it. And there may be several reasons for this. For one, Pharaoh may not know it, but Jacob does represent God's chosen people. Uh, Jacob is pretty special. Uh, Jacob has a connection with God that most people in the world do not have at this moment. Uh, but secondly, I would also point out Jacob is most likely significantly older than this particular Pharaoh. Uh, remember, in our class a few weeks ago, we learned that Joseph had become a father to Pharaoh, probably indicating that this Pharaoh was significantly younger than Joseph, who was in his mid to late 30s at this point. 
and Jacob is significantly older than Joseph. And so it's possible then that Jacob at the age of 130 is well over 100 years older than this particular Pharaoh. And if this Pharaoh is really young, a teen or maybe even in his preteens, uh, it is within the realm of possibility that when he sees Jacob walk in, he might have pretty much blurted out, wow, you are old. <laughs> Kids have a way of saying stuff like that, don't they? So I'm saying it, even if he was a, a really young Pharaoh, uh, he might have really been impressed. I don't see people who are 130 years old on a daily basis, like, wow, you are old kind of response. Uh, but this is a way also of finding commonality. You know, what do you do for a living? And man, you're old. How long have you been around? You know, what are your life experiences? That's that kind of question. So Jacob's old age maybe is a conversation starter, especially when we remember uh, that these guys are speaking through an interpreter. So that right there would have been very difficult, unless jo Joseph might have been doing the interpreting. But I'm saying there was a language barrier, at least between uh, Jacob and the Pharaoh. Uh, one other big thing I think we notice in this interaction is that Jacob is somewhat bitter, isn't he? And I don't know whether that's the best word to use. I don't know if that's the best way of putting it. Maybe you can think up a better way of summarizing this. But to me, it's pretty obvious, and I think to most of us, that Jacob had lived a pretty difficult life. It, it was not a pleasant life from his point of view. I mean, even though he's 130 years old, he says, few and unpleasant have been the years of my life. Yeah, it's been a long life, but it hasn't necessarily been a good life or an easy life. And this man has been through a lot, including thinking that his favorite son had been eaten by a wild animal. From what I understand from others, from some of you, it is incredibly difficult to lose a child. And it has a way of changing a life for the worse. It can make a person extremely bitter. It can be a very difficult thing to live through. And the other part of this is that Jacob realizes that he hasn't lived as long as some of his fairly recent ancestors. Remember, as we've studied through the book of Genesis, we've seen the, the lifespans take a huge nosedive in the years following the flood. Now, that hasn't been too long ago from this perspective. So at the flood, something changed. Something really changed in terms of lifespans. You know, people went from living in their 900s down to just barely living into their mid-100s. So we talked about this a few months ago. You know, the water canopy that disappeared that used to protect us from the UV rays. People would age a lot longer. Genetic mutations would have increased. Any number of things, but something happened with the flood where, where lifespans just uh, really went down. And Jacob can see this. And that's a terrifying thing, is it? You know, if I know my great, 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 great grandfather lived to eight or nine hundred and, and here my you know, great grandparents only lived just a fraction of that. And here I am, you know, barely holding on at the age of 130, which at one time would have been your youth, practically. Uh, something happened and he can see this. He's, he's aware of this. He knows this. And so he can see that he's about to die way younger than most of his ancestors. And that that could have contributed to this bitterness that uh, seems to come through in these verses. Well, ultimately in this passage, we have Joseph getting his family settled in the land of Egypt in a region now described in this passage as the land of Ramses, maybe indicating previous ownership. And at the end, since they're still in the famine, we find that Joseph provides them with food as well. So he's giving them a place to live and he's also providing them with food. So this brings us to Genesis 47 verses 13 through 19. The next paragraph here, Genesis 47, verses 13 through 19. Now there was no food in all the land because the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. When the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food, for why should we die in your presence, for our money is gone? Then Joseph said, Give up your livestock, and I will give you food for your livestock, since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses and the flocks and the herds and the donkeys. And he fed them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. When that year was ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. 
and the cattle are my Lord's. There's nothing left for my Lord except our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we and our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. So give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. In this passage, we have the next three years of the famine. It seems to be that we're very close to the end of the famine. I'm not sure if these are the last three years of the famine, but these are three years of the famine as it gets toward the end. I think I can say that for sure at this point. But in the first of these next three years, the people give Joseph all of their money in exchange for food. That's it. None left. In the second of the next three years, they run out of money, so they give Joseph their livestock. And then in the third year of the three years mentioned here, they're out of money, they have no more livestock, so they come to Joseph admitting that they have nothing left but themselves and the land that they live on, and they don't want to die. And so they offer up their land, they offer to sell themselves as slaves to Pharaoh in exchange for food. So they are begging for seed so that the land doesn't go completely desolate. These people are desperate, aren't they? Absolutely, completely desperate. Uh, but thankfully, Joseph uh, still has grain to trade, so he is in an awesome spot. And the land of Egypt is in a pretty good position here as well, having prepared for this under his direction from God's uh, visions. So this brings us to Genesis 47, verses 20 through 26. Genesis 47, 20 through 26. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every Egyptian sold his field because the famine was so was severe upon them. Thus the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he removed them to the cities, from one end of Egypt's border to the other. Only the land of the priest he did not buy, for the priest had an allotment from Pharaoh, and they lived off the allotment which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have today brought you and your land, bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and you may sow the land. At the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four-fifths shall be your own for seed of the field, and for your food, and for those of your households, and as food for your little ones. So they said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's slaves. Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, valid to this day, that Pharaoh should have the fifth. Only the land of the priests did not become Pharaoh's. Up at the beginning here, Joseph executes the plan from the previous paragraph, and the people are so desperate for food that they trade everything. They sell their land, they sell themselves as slaves to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh redistributes the people. As I understand that, he kind of uh, spreads them out evenly throughout the land from one border of Egypt to the other, except for the priests, since the priests still had land of their own. They had a special agreement. Uh, but Pharaoh owns basically everything at this point, the livestock, the land, even the people. And so as the famine comes near the end, he distributes seed. But in exchange, he demands, notice, one-fifth back in taxes, a, a tax of 20%, if I've done the math correctly. Uh, but I, this, it's a big tax. Uh, but the people are willing, and they're almost eager to pay it. They're thankful for the opportunity because Pharaoh has saved their lives. Uh, they owe him everything. And this became a long-term tradition so that the people in Egypt would pay 20% in taxes. So let's conclude tonight with Genesis 47, verses 27 through 31. Genesis 47, 27 through 31. Now Israel lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen, and they acquired property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time for Israel to die drew near, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Please, if I have found favor in your sight, place now your hand under my thigh and deal with me in kindness and faithfulness. Please do not bury me in Egypt. But when I lie down with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. He said, Swear to me. So he swore to him. Then Israel bowed in worship at the head of the bed. Starting in verse 27, we learn that Israel prospers in Egypt. Jacob and his sons seem to do well wherever they go, and Egypt is no exception to that. Uh, even as the famine wraps up, as people are selling themselves and their property to Pharaoh, these people acquire property in the area, and they're fruitful. They do well. 
and Jacob lives to the age of 147. He, now, he's not dead yet, okay? He's still sticking around, but it's close. He lives to the age of 147, and he is in his 147th year, so it's right here. Um, uh, but before he dies, he calls Joseph in, and he wants Joseph to make a promise that he not bury him in Egypt. You know, we don't belong here. This is not our land. So when I die, take me out of here and bury me back in the promised land. And, and Joseph not only agrees to this, but he takes an oath. I don't know if you remember when we studied uh, God making an oath. Remember there was the promise and the oath. God made a promise to Abraham, and then he sealed it with an oath. Not for God's purpose. It wasn't to remind God. This was for Abraham's benefit. So I think we see this exact same thing here. We have the promise, and then, then there is an oath. And as we learned in the book of Hebrews a couple weeks ago, um, that's how a matter ends. You know, if you, you make a promise, and then once you've made the oath, that is the end of it. That is the end of that agreement, end of discussion. It's over. And so, did you notice what they did to seal the oath in this circumstance? Joseph puts his hand on or under his dad's thigh. Okay, that's a little weird, isn't it? That's a strange custom. Uh, but customs are certainly different in other cultures and places and other times. Uh, we think about uh, God's covenant with Abraham and how they split the animals. Remember that? And they walked between the, the halves of the animals and had the burning, the flaming oven and, and all that. Um, circumcision, in a way, was like a, a sealing of an oath. Well, that's a weird one as well. Uh, think about the book of Ruth. If I remember correctly, didn't they swap sandals? Uh, with the deal at the end of the book of Ruth, you know, here, you take my sandal, I'll take yours, and now wherever I go, I'll, I'll remember this this oath or this promise that I made. I mean, that's unusual. So a lot of unusual ways uh, to seal promises. Uh, today, what do we do? Normally, we sign a, a bunch of papers, um, and that's how we seal an oath. Now, we can do that digitally, electronically, uh, or we sign, you know, on a line, something along those lines. Uh, but this was the custom back in the time of Joseph. Uh, you know, putting the hand on the thigh, sitting on the other person's thigh is one way that this may be worded. So we close the chapter then with Israel bowing down in worship at the head of his bed. Okay, so that brings us to the end of Genesis 47. And if I could mention briefly just one possible practical application, I think we see the value here of honoring our families. And I think we also see the value of forgiveness, and that's been a lesson we've learned over the past several chapters. Joseph took care of his people, and these are the same brothers who sold him into slavery. He could have done anything to them. He could have had them killed on the spot, um, but he watches out for them, and he makes sure that they're taken care of. So a good lesson on getting through some difficult times, and some of you have been through some very difficult circumstances, but I'm just saying... Uh, Joseph may have most of us beat. Uh, beat up by his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery. I mean, we've been through some interesting things, uh, some of us, but uh, that, that's pretty severe. But even with that, uh, he was able to work beyond it. So Jacob is now very close to the end of his life. And as I said, we know he lives for 147 years, that he is in his 147th year, if I've understood this correctly. So the, the end is near. And we'll get back to more about that next week when we come to Genesis chapter 48. Uh, Genesis only has 50 chapters, and so the end is near for us as well, at least the end of our, uh, this series of lessons. Uh, I am thinking about continuing on with the book of Exodus. I uh, haven't completely nailed that down yet. I'm kind of leaning in that direction. That would certainly allow us to avoid taking time to review all of the background information. You know, if we go to something else and come back to Exodus in a year, then we're going to have to kind of get up to speed. It may take us a week or two to do that. So it may save some time in that regard, uh, since Genesis pretty much continues right into Exodus, just flows from one book to the other. Uh, but let, let me know what you think, if you have any thoughts on that. But that's the way I'm uh, uh, tentatively heading here. Uh, but thank you for joining us tonight. We're glad to uh, have you with us. I hope to see most of you in person this coming Lord's Day at 9.30 as we continue with Isaiah, and then after class we plan on coming together at 10.30 for the worship assembly where we hope to get back to the study of Hebrews. So we are now ready uh, to dig deep with Melchizedek and try to learn some lessons from that very interesting and unusual Bible character. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thank you, Father, for telling us about Jacob and his sons in your book, and thank you for the reminders about your loving care and how you continue to provide for this family, even through some very difficult times. We're thankful for the way your people were able to bless their neighbors, even those who didn't know you at the time. And we pray that you may use us in some similar way. Father, uh, help us to share your love with the world around us. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.